to, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you did before the war, where you grew up, and just what you did before entering? Very glad to. I grew up in a little town in southern Minnesota, where they make spam, Austin, Minnesota. And uh, my father was a banker, so like IBM people, we got moved around from bank to bank at that time. And we moved up to another little town in Minnesota, and then we moved out to Aberdeen, South Dakota, where I went to high school. I was very lucky, because although Aberdeen is the second largest city in the state, being 18,000, the people that ran the school system wanted to provide terrific education. And in that small city in South Dakota, we had terrific teachers. And <coughs> I uh, went on from there to Amherst College. And <coughs> it was at that time that uh, the war started. Nobody studied at Amherst College because we all knew we were going to war. We all knew we were going to war. And nobody really studied, and we all went to war. I think in our class it was over 90% joined up and went, went off to war. They left the college and went to war. How did that feel, uh, just knowing that you had the possibility of serving and knowing that you were going to be going and that there wasn't really a choice? I wanted to go. In fact, I have a history in my family of a great uncle that left prep school, deserted the whole family, went down, got on a sailing ship in the late 1800s and took off for China without his family, knew nothing about this. And I felt I had some sea blood in me. And I wanted to go to Boston and, uh, and do something for the war. Everybody wanted to do something for the war, and, and I, that was the one thing I wanted to do. It just so happened that uh, at college, we had heard about a program that was opening up in the Air Force, it was called in those days, <coughs> a pre-meteorology program. That <coughs> the Air Force wanted a meteorologist on every B-17, and they announced at the college that you could enlist and apply to see if you could get into this program, which I did. I went down to Springfield, Massachusetts, and enlisted and applied to get into the, it was called a pre-meteorology program. To become a meteorologist in those days was a very grinding um, ordeal because it involved a lot of mathematics and physics and uh, and that was why we had to learn the calculus, vector mechanics, and physics uh, before you could go into a meteorology program. And we were in a pre-meteorology program. The Air Force made a deal with 12 different colleges uh, to train 250 men each to become meteorologists. <clears throat> We were supposed to have a meteorologist on every B-17. That sounds a little bit ridiculous, doesn't it? Well, it was ridiculous. And the reason it was probably ridiculous was because we didn't know it. But at that time, not only did the Air Force make a deal with 12 colleges to train 250 men for a year, before they could even go into meteorology. This was, pre, this was just calculus and, and uh, vector mechanics and physics. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy also had a program. I want to tell you how big it was. They had 131 colleges that they made a deal with, and they produced 60,000 men. That was called the V-12 program. The Army wasn't to, to be outdone. They had an even bigger program. It was called ASTP. American Specialized Training Program, and that was even bigger than the Navy and way bigger than the Air Force. And <clears throat> they all went off to college. Now, I have heard, and I don't know whether this has been verified, but when Roosevelt heard that we were going off to war, he knew that we were probably going to have a pretty bloody war. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to have some people with brains left afterwards and he told each one of the services, I want you to take aside specialized people, 
and keep them training for at least a year. Our program was a year, B-12 was a year, and the, um, <laughs> the Army program was even longer than a year, and it was even huger, it was bigger. So there were a lot of people in just studying, but wearing a uniform. And uh, uh, the Army realized after the war got started that they needed people to fight as well as get trained, so they had to cut back on the ASTP program. But the V-12 Navy program went on to completion. Our program that I was in uh, went on for nine months when it became obvious that you don't need a meteorologist <laughs> on every B-17. And they abandoned the program, but they let us finish those last three months. So we were there for the whole 12 months completing the program. Out of our the one school that I went to, one person became a meteorologist out of those 250. And <clears throat> all the rest of us went on to different parts of the service. Uh, because they had, uh, they couldn't train that number. Of me they didn't need that number of meteorologists. Mm -hmm. They sent me to um, a communications school. I was at Amherst College for 12 months learning meteorology. Then they sent me to Yale to learn communications. And while I was at Yale, Captain Glenn Miller was there with his band. Mm. And every lunchtime, Glenn Miller had a balcony up off the end of where we had our lunch. We had Glenn Miller music for lunch every single day. <laughs> and on Sunday, we all had to march on, the, you know, the big green up at, at New Haven, the, mm -hmm. the commons. We'd all get out there for <clears throat> a parade every Sunday. And then all the men in the service would stand on the side at parade rest while Glenn Miller would march his band back and forth playing buckle down, wind sake, buckle down. <laughs> it was a tough life. But <clears throat> it was very demanding. In one sense, you had to pass because we all knew that if you didn't pass, you're going overseas immediately. And so we all studied hard. And when I graduated, I was sent out to Sioux Falls to teach enlisted men Morse code and all that I knew about communications at that time. And I was there for a brief period of time. And I got a leave one weekend to go visit my parents <coughs> that lived in South Dakota. So I, I went home over the weekend. While I was gone, there was a demand that they needed somebody to learn the new radar that was being developed for the Air Corps. And, um, and they said, who are we going to send? Well, I wasn't there to defend myself, so they said, send Banfield. So I got sent. <laughs> I got sent. Now, where did they send me? They sent me down to Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I went down. Uh, we had taken over the Boca Raton Club. And uh, they taught me all there was to learn about radar at that time, which was highly used by the Air Corps because it located where to bomb and how to locate where they wanted to bomb. Uh, and my job was just to keep the equipment in shape. And after I had learned all that, I got sent out to an Air Force base. Now, this is all taking so long <laughs> that the war ended. And I'm now <laughs> out in Kansas, and I'm assigned to a B-17 outfit. For, and we were all scheduled to fly to Frankfurt, Germany. The war had ended in Germany. And I said, wow, what an opportunity. And we were all set to go. Then they lowered the number of points. You got out of the Army. You accumulated points by, if you were in combat, you got a lot of points. And if you were by the length of time and how severe it was. And if you got enough points, you could get out of the Army because the, uh, the, the war in uh, England and in Europe had ended. And uh, we were all set to fly to Frankfurt, and they lowered the points, and we lost a third of our crew. We built the crew up again. We were all set to go again, and they lowered the points again. And they came to me, and they said, you know, we're not going to get a crew. Do you want to get out of the Army? I hadn't done anything. And I, well, that was the end of my Army career. So that now you've heard my entire Army career. <clears throat> um, at the time you applied to be in the Air Force, when they put you through college, was there any possibility you might be 
drafted into the army or a, or a navy as, an, as infantry or a sailor or anything like that? Is there any other possibility of you being in a different branch of service? Well, not really, because I applied to get into this program. Mm -hmm. And once they accepted me, I was, I was locked into that program. Mm -hmm. Now, that program, we started with 250 men at Amherst College, and we ended with 155. But we got, the tests came out. All these colleges, was, we all took the same courses, all 12 colleges, and read from the same book. Uh, and, and so the, the test came out of Chicago. Well, if you didn't get high enough on your score, you immediately went over to overseas. And so it was a great impetus to, to study. Yep. But it also, interestingly enough, it, it actually graded the college because they could see, they could compare the 12 colleges how, how well they did. Well, Amherst wanted to be number one. Mm -hmm. So we were low in physics. We weren't up. So they replaced the physics professor and got a new one, and we boosted our grade. But anyway, that was uh, what went on for 12 months. We worked hard. We worked <coughs> six and a half days every week. We got one week vacation out of 52 that we were there. So it was uh, we got a year and a half credit for college uh, out, of the, out of the year that I was there. And uh, um, that, w that was good. Yeah. What was your favorite thing to do in all of the programs that you went through? What was your favorite program? My favorite program? Well, probably radar at the end. It was, uh, it was brand new, and uh, we were stationed in Florida, and we'd go up in the airplane, and uh, the radar officer would would have an oscilloscope in front of him, which looked down. And being in Florida, it was very nice because the ocean was one color and land was another. So you could see, you knew where you were. And uh, that was probably about, about uh, uh, the most interesting. I, I couldn't stand communications because I wasn't good at it. And uh, uh, it was tough. Uh, my period at Amherst, of course, was uh, I liked calculus, I liked vector mechanics, and I was good at physics. Um, and uh, I obviously liked it, but I, you know, it's schoolwork. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, so what was your main, like, purpose and motivation for joining the United States military at the time of World War II? Oh. Was it just to help out the war, as you said before? Absolutely. Or? I think Roosevelt did a fantastic job of preparing the country that we were going, we all wanted to go to war. There was a, we knew the enemy, and it was clear in our mind that, and we wanted to go. It was, yeah. it was universal. Uh, it was everybody uh, had the same object, mm -hmm. and that was to win the war. And what were your first thoughts and initial impressions of the military when you did? Uh, <laughs> uh, not high. Um, I went to <coughs> Fort Devens to get a uniform, and um, we were sort of introduced to Army life, mm -hmm. which is <coughs> you do what you're told. Mm -hmm. And then we were all put on a train to go. We knew there were 12 colleges in the program, mm -hmm. and we didn't know where we were going. They don't tell you anything in the Army. You just obey your next highest in command. And we got on the train and everywhere I said, where are we going? Where are we going? Because we wanted to know. We knew one of the colleges was Pomona out in, on the West Coast. And we were hoping we were going to be taken out to Pomona. That sounded like a wonderful place. Anyway, we go about 35 miles to Amherst College. And we get there. And now I get introduced to the Army for the first time. It's a light. Some, a snow similar to today, big flakes and coming down. It was nice and quiet. There wasn't any wind. And who greets us but, you guys get in line. The sergeant was from Chicago with an accent like Chicago. And we immediately got the word, OK, here's, here's the way the Army works. And, and so that was my introduction to real Army life. <laughs> um, so just to go 
you told us most of what happened, what, what you were doing during the war, but what was, where were you when you got the news that the war was finally over? I was in the officers club at Boca Raton playing pool. <laughs> Uh, and and I heard that uh, uh, the war was over. Yeah. What was your reaction? Grateful, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, grateful. Also, taking a step back into the when you first joined the military, um, being a, being a college student at the time, did you have to complete any sort of boot camp or basic training when you first were admitted to the program? Or? I was at Fort Devens for maybe five days. They gave me a uniform. I think we may have marched a little bit, but we spent most of the time in the barracks waiting to be shipped yeah. out. Uh, that was just a, a bias. The, the, um, uh, we always had athletics all the way through the time I was in uniform. Um, at Amherst, uh, they had a very vigorous program, but they said uh, they needed a band. And I played the clarinet, so I uh, said, listen, I'll, I'll be in the band. So if you're in the band, you didn't have to do exercise. So I, I was in the band. <laughs> and, but then I got to Yale. Oh, they had an exercise guy there that, that put us through the ropes. Uh, yeah. And it was torture. He really got us in shape. Yeah. And uh, so that was very vigorous. Then I graduated from that communication school at Yale. And um, I went down to South Carolina for just a brief period, and that was regular Army stuff. Yeah. And then I went out to South Dakota. But when I got out to South Dakota and were training the enlisted men, um, that was, uh, there was no exercise or anything. We just had a job. Yeah. And uh, I, I was busy. Uh, 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 doing doing that, you yeah. yeah. And speaking of the uh, instructor you had that talked like a person from Chicago and your instructor at Yale, was there, were there any other mentors and teachers, instructors that you vividly remember from back when you served? Well, Captain Parliament was in charge of <coughs> our unit at Amherst. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh yes, we had a corporal, mm -hmm. Corporal Blank, Corporal Blank, uh, was a very nice guy and uh, was always making mistakes in his English language, which we always would laugh at. Uh, but we all liked Corporal Blank. He was a really nice guy, and we thought he should be in our program, yeah. uh, although he probably didn't have the, the, the intellect that could have gotten him <laughs> through the courses. But we all liked Corporal Blank. Captain Parliament, we had almost nothing to do with. Captain Parliament would get drunk on the weekend, and we didn't really have a lot of respect for him. <laughs> uh, at the time we were at Amherst, they, they moved other <coughs> armed units into uh, uh, the college, so the college was filled. They didn't have any students, so they had to fill it with something. And one of the units that came there was a pre-West Point unit. And <coughs> they had a captain that was typically you know, West Point, very strict. And uh, as the pre-meteorologists would march from class to class, we would sing songs <coughs> very commonly uh, on the risque side. Well, the captain of the West Point unit thought that that was inappropriate mm -hmm. for them to be singing these songs and told us, or told our Captain Parliament, your men shouldn't be singing those songs as they march between the classes. Well, that only made us sing the more. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we... Uh, <laughs> And, and incidentally, uh, this captain that was head of the West Point unit, uh, they were there and they learned some history before they went off to West Point. And the teacher that they had at Amherst uh, was moderately famous for his uh, teaching of history. And the captain from West Point didn't like what he was teaching his men and to went to the college and said, uh, I want you to remove the history professor that's teaching my men, he's not teaching them the right thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't go over so well with the college because he was quite a good history professor. 
Plus, the Secretary of War happened to have graduated from Amherst College. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't but about two days then the captain from the West Point unit was removed. Yeah. So that uh, uh, they kept teaching the way they were. And also on a different note, Although you didn't see combat, did you have any friends or colleagues or close acquaintances that did see combat? And oh, yes. Do you, have any oh, of their, yeah. do you know any of their experience? And My brother-in-law mm -hmm. went in at Omaha Beach in Normandy. I'll tell you an interesting story about his going in at, at Normandy. He went in, and they collected themselves after the initial onslaught. Mm -hmm. And one of the favorite <coughs> men in their unit was the barber, and they couldn't find the barber. They, they got all the men together, where's our barber, where's our barber, we gotta mm -hmm. find the barber. And they, they looked all over, they couldn't find him. And so they went from house to house, and, and they went to this one farmhouse, and they said, well, there's, there's somebody down in the cellar, maybe he's your barber, and they went down in the cellar. Well, Normandy is famous for Calvados, which is a very mm -hmm. strong alcoholic drink. Mm -hmm. And he went out looking for some Calvados, and couldn't find any, but he went in the cellar of this farmhouse and there was a huge keg of Calvados. Mm -hmm. But he didn't know how to get it out. Well, he had a bayonet and he went under, on the bottom side and poked a hole underneath it and he lay down underneath it. He was completely inebriated. <laughs> He'd been drinking Calvados uh, from the barrel that he, anyway, yeah. that, was, uh, that was my brother-in-law. Uh, who else do I know? That, well, we, I have classmates that, that were in the war. Uh, I have had one uh, classmate uh, that was just an ensign and was that night in charge of the boat that they were in the Pacific. Yeah. And <clears throat> the captain of the ship was sleeping. He was on duty for the night. And a submarine was approaching. And, and so <clears throat> he called down the captain. He said, Captain, there's a, there's a submarine approaching. He's just an ensign. And the captain said, do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they did. They made it through, and everything yeah. was fine. But uh, uh, yeah, there were. Oh yes, I have other other classmates that were in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yes, we we have have many that were. Well, I, as you gather from my story, <coughs> far from any conflict. Mm -hmm. If you were given the opportunity to serve in the military or the navy or anything like that, would you have? wanted to to go out oh absolutely i would have done anything yeah oh yes i i i did select maybe i could i could tell you a little bit about why i think i got such favorable treatment all through the war i didn't have any rich father thinking of jfk in these days uh that would help me uh get a cushy job uh, mm -hmm. during the war. I've always wondered why I did have such a fortunate experience, and I think it goes back to high school. I had a terrific education, and I applied myself 100%. I did get the physics award when I graduated from high school, and I think all that contributed to getting these breaks as things went along. In other words, I think all kids in high school, and maybe especially now, should apply themselves as best they can and do the very best they can in all their subjects because it gets noticed. And I have a feeling that that was one of the reasons I came to seem to get favorable jobs all during the war. And while you were away from home at college, where be it uh, at Yale, Amherst, how, were, how was it that you could keep in touch with your family or, and friends, or did you not? Or? Oh yes, oh yes. Letters. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Letters, not telephone. Letters. My mother yeah. was a terrific letter writer. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah. yeah. And that was, uh, that was how we, uh, uh, when I was at Yale, I was, uh, the first exam we had in communications, I was slow at. I w it was not anything I was good at. And 
we had to do the wiring and, and, and cook. And as soon as you got it finished, you, you raised your hand and somebody come over and check you, and then you go on to the next problem. Well, <clears throat> I was slow. And so by the time I got to raise my hand that I'd completed the job, uh, all the officers were examining other, other men. Well, I wasn't getting any attention, so I snapped my fingers a few times. Well, you don't snap your fingers to get an officer's attention in the... <clears throat> so I immediately failed the first exam. Yeah. If you fail two exams, you're out. So as far as communications, I wrote my mother and I said, uh, listen, things aren't looking so good here. I, I may be out of here. Don't feel too badly. I, I'm doing the best I can. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess I did the best I could because we, I did manage to get through. Uh, but I communicated to her at that time. I, I didn't think I was going to make it. Is there anything else you would like to tell us about your experience or anything like that? No, just that South Dakota, was a wonderful place. The people didn't have much, but they made the most of what they had. I was lucky. <laughs> Thank you very much Thank for you your, very time. Much for your time. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we may have a couple of questions from the audience. I actually have one this time. Good. Uh, you mentioned FDR uh, motivating the country uh, to, 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 to be ready for this challenge. Um, and, and at the same time, I know when Pearl Harbor happened, that was a, a kind of motivation for this it country. It was a big motivation. Can, can you talk about the, 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 the coincidence of the two? Was this country ready for warfare, uh, ready to commit itself? to that degree before Pearl Harbor, or, and, you know, FDR and, and events, where do we go? <laughs> have you been watching the PBS thing on, it, on JFK? I have not. Okay, last night you missed it then. Uh, the reason JFK came along, he felt that the Americans were not ready for war. We had not been prepared. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so JFK's whole motivation was to get us. He had been to all the countries and saw what was going on and knew that we were ill-prepared and wanted to get us prepared. And uh, so essentially, we were not really ready uh, at, the, at the beginning. But due to the terrific, if you put your mind to it, you can do it, and we did it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, other questions we have? I know you guys prepared some questions today. Wait. You'll have to speak up loudly. Stand up, please. OK, so uh, how has the war, if at all, changed your outlook on life? So how has the war changed your outlook on life? Well, my experience of war was a terrific education. Uh, I was in training, it seems, like the whole time. How did it change my outlook on life? You see, I didn't experience war. Uh, as I, I never saw anything uh, as you may, well, you, this is your only class, right? Uh, but so many. So many other people did, but I did not. Um, I, so I, 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 uh, I don't think I can answer that question uh, other than that I got a terrific education. I didn't even realize that I'd been so favorably uh, uh, acted upon during that time. I since have, have come to that opinion, but it took a long time before I realized how specialized I and many others had been 
take it. Uh, one more thing about that ASD, progr ASD program the Army did that was so huge. You had to have an IQ higher than the Army required to become an officer to get into ASTP. So they, were, they really wanted to save some brains. And they, and they did. And I, I did use mine and became a doctor. Thank you. Uh, we have time maybe for one more question. Go ahead, stand up, please. Right. Um, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, do you remember where you were and uh, what was your reaction? It was a Sunday. I was on the carpet in our living room. We had it at Water Kent radio. Now radios in those days were about this wide and this tall. And it came over the radio. And uh, uh, I very definitely remember that uh, I was in Aberdeen, South Dakota. I was, uh, uh, I guess, a junior in high school. And uh, 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 of course, we all knew the, the implications. Uh, and we heard Roosevelt tell us that one of the worst things that has ever happened to the United States. Yeah? Uh, one, one last question. Prior to the war breaking out, would you have thought or defined yourself as being a patriotic person? Why would I even ask the question of myself? What did it change? Did it change you to become more patriotic in any way? I hate that word, patriotic. Okay. Um, uh, well, it certainly, uh, I wanted to protect and fight for our country. If that's your definition of patriotic, why, that's, uh, that's what I wanted, yeah. I, I would have done anything. And I think that was instilled in, I think I wasn't different. Everybody wanted to do, I would have done anything. Oh, I'll tell you one more experience of mine. We, we have about a minute, so the okay. bell's gonna ring in a minute. So <coughs> not, you'll be interrupted by a bell. Okay, fine. I was, I was uh, now in medical school and we were at Columbia and the president of Columbia was uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And <clears throat> he then, becoming president of Columbia, decided to visit all the different colleges. So he decided to come out and visit the medical school. Well, medical school amphitheaters, I don't know if you know this, but they're very steep and they go down to a very narrow pit. Uh, pres uh, president of Columbia, Eisenhower, came in and I, I had heard that he was going to come. He was talking to the freshman. I was not a freshman, but I got into the back row up at the top. When he came in, I was so impressed. If they'd said there's a, a, a dangerous procedure that anybody volunteer, you're not liable to come back, we need you, I would have raised my hand just looking at that guy. I, I, I thank you today for your time. Uh, this was incredible. Uh, I, if we could give a round of applause. Uh,